we can, okay, I guess we can get started. Um, thank you so much for coming, Dr. Uh, Gransinger. Um, so just an introduction, um, we're very excited to have Dr. Brick Gransinger here with us today. She's a professor at Berkeley and an HHMI investigator. Um, her research focuses on host virus interactions and particularly herpes uh, transcription. And if you haven't already, I strongly recommend checking out her lectures. Uh, um, there's many of them on YouTube on coronavirus biology and herpes virus biology, and she's an amazing communicator. Um, we're super excited to have you here. Um, on logistical note, please uh, stay muted and keep your questions till the end of the talk. Um, and when you have to ask a question, please uh, do a hand raising uh, reaction on Zoom and we will unmute you and let you ask your question. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we can get started. Thank you, Syed. I will go ahead and share my screen once this one is taken off because I can't share it at the same time. Perfect. All right, can everybody see it and hear me okay? Yes, okay, perfect. Looks good. Thanks so much for the invitation. Um, as I had mentioned, I basically spent my career studying virus-host interactions that center on gene expression. Um, and that's really because I see in its essence, the battle between a virus and a host is one that comes down to the control of gene expression. So on the host side, these are the responses that drive and amplify antiviral signaling. And so the ability of a virus to subvert those signals and at the same time redirect that machinery towards viral gene expression really, I think, represents the crux of whether an infection is going to take over or peter out. And because this is such a central facet of viral biology, many different viruses encode factors with the dedicated job of shutting down host gene expression. These are called host shutoff factors and they've really captivated me for years. Um, I'm showing you here some examples of, of host shutoff factors. My lab has worked on all of these that you're seeing in the cytoplasm here. Um, and what we found is that host shutoff factors, many of them, seem to converge on targeting cellular messenger RNA. Um, and uh, basically what that means is that when these proteins are expressed, um, they result in a large scale depletion of cellular messenger RNA. And this is thought to do at least two things for the virus. The first sort of obviously is that because all viruses are in competition with their host cell for access to ribosomes, this can help shunt translation resources towards viral transcripts uh, for, for protein synthesis. And then second, um, it, for many viruses, host shutoff has been shown to be an important component of their immune evasion strategy. So the thinking here is that in casting a wide net of RNAs that get targeted, um, within that net, viruses can capture um, uh, RNAs that are immune stimulatory, things like interferon um, uh, induced genes and things like that. And so in just sort of globally dampening those, these helps viruses um, sort of fly beneath the immunological radar. And we've been working on these in the context of herpes viruses um, for almost my whole uh, career, certainly my career here at Berkeley. And so that's really what I'm gonna focus on um, today. So maybe contrary to popular belief, I would argue that herpes viruses are the most successful human pathogens. And that's because um, pretty much everybody on the planet we think is infected with one of the nine known human herpes viruses. Probably a few of them, you start collecting them relatively early in life. And these are viruses that once you're infected with them, you cannot clear them. And that's of course, because they're able to establish lifelong latency in our cells. They do not integrate into our genomes. Um, instead, they exist as circularized DNA episomes that are basically tethered to the host chromatin. So they're double-stranded DNA viruses. Um, we're not the only um, ones that are afflicted with herpes viruses. It's thought that probably most vertebrates and even some invertebrates like oysters and coral get herpes. So they're really 
widespread on the planet, and they're also incredibly ancient. Um, it's estimated that herpes viruses evolved something like 200 to 400 million years ago, way before humans became humans. And that means that they have a really sort of extensive co-evolutionary history with us and their other hosts. Um, and um, because of this, we think of them as really good models to understand virus-host interactions that have been quite exquisitely honed over our evolution. My lab studies a subfamily of herpes viruses called gamma herpes viruses. Um, there are, these are the oncogenic herpes viruses, basically. There's two human herpes viruses in this subfamily, Epstein-Barr virus or EBV. Um, this causes a number of B-cell cancers and just last year was shown to be the main etiologic agent of multiple sclerosis. And Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus, or KSHV, which is the main virus we work on. Um, this is the dominant cause of cancer in untreated AIDS patients. And in some regions of Africa where HIV endemicity is really high, this can be the most common cause of cancer there. Um, we also study a, a close relative of these two human viruses called MHV68. This is a, a murine herpes virus that's pretty much a widely used tool in the field, um, both for understanding in vivo biology of these because herpes viruses are incredibly species specific, um, but also to understand lytic or active uh, replication cycle events. And, and while I said that all of these viruses establish lifelong latency in their hosts, um, of course, in order to produce new viral particles and spread host to host or cell to cell, they have to reactivate from latency and engage in active or lytic replication. And that is the phase of the viral life cycle that my lab uh, is almost exclusively focused on. And that's because during lytic replication of these viruses, there are really dramatic changes happening to the host gene expression landscape. Um, and a number of these changes are driven by host shutoff. So in KSHV and the other gamma herpes viruses, Host shutoff is caused, um, we think, primarily by a viral endonuclease that's called SOX. Um, the activity of this endonuclease, which targets broadly messenger RNA in the cytoplasm of cells, um, has been shown to have a lot of important sort of um, uh, roles in the viral life cycle from immunovation, which I'd already told you about. Uh, it's been shown using the mouse model that if the virus cannot elicit host shutoff, uh, the virus has defects in trafficking from its initial site of infection to where it needs to go, which are germinal center B cells um, in, in the animal. It has a 10,000 fold defect in the ability to establish latency in these B cells. It has replication defects in the B cells. And more broadly, beyond just controlling uh, host gene expression, it influences the expression of viral genes as well. And so by not having this host shutoff feature, we'd previously shown that you get sort of skewed composition of viral particles that are released from cells, which can then um, cause alterations in the next de novo stage of infection. So that's just to say that, that over the years, we and others have shown that this process really does play a fundamental role in the biology of the virus. And so my lab's been really interested in, in dissecting mechanistically how this happens. And I'm just going to show one really simplistic slide to summarize uh, many years of work, which is that we know that SOX is a messenger RNA specific ribo-endonuclease. And so it cannot target RNAs, unless they are transcribed by RNA polymerase II, this is the polymerase that makes our own messenger RNA. And then it, uh, so once it recognizes a PAL2 transcript through a process that is still largely mysterious, um, it uses a combination of RNA sequence and structure. So it has to be a pretty degenerate sequence because it needs to be represented on most messenger RNAs in the cell um, to form a, a sort of a structure that that serves as a landing pad for SOX, whereupon it um, cleaves the RNA here, uh, it, it, which is called the endonucleolytic cleavage event. So in between the RNA. And, and what this does is immediately pulls the RNA out of the translation pool and it exposes unprotected five prime and three prime ends, which can then be attacked by cellular exoribonucleases like XRN1 uh, and the exosome, which clear those translationally inactivated fragments. 
And I'm telling you this because this two-step process of the viral initiating event, which pulls the, which does that initial cut reaction, and the cellular uh, nucleases that clear those transcripts, turns out to be really important for something I'm going to tell you later on. Um, so we have spent obviously time trying to understand mechanisms evolved in host shutoff factor targeting and escape and things like that, but that's not what I'm going to tell you about today. Um, over the last several years. We've been using uh, SOX and other host shutoff factors as tools to ask how is it that cells sense and respond to large changes in messenger RNA abundance. And so I'm going to tell you two stories today. The first one is mostly published, some unpublished, but I want to give you a, a sort of a taste of where we're going with this, um, in which we've described a new pathway that connects seemingly very distant phases of the messenger RNA life cycle. So connects the last stage of an RNA's life, its destruction in the cytoplasm, with the first stage of its life, its synthesis in the nucleus. And then uh, for the second part of my talk, I'm going to switch and, and uh, tell you an entirely unpublished story about how it is that the virus is able to steal some of this machinery that it's shutting down to organize a unique strategy to transcribe um, a set of essential viral genes late in the viral life cycle. All right, so this first story begins with the idea that in an uninfected cell, um, the cell is seeking basically to achieve an appropriate balance of messenger RNA level. So this is a, called the homeostasis model, and it's been well supported uh, now by data in yeast and also data in mammalian cells. And what this says is that, for example, if you globally increase the stability of the messenger RNA pool, say by getting rid of some of the nucleases that might be involved in um, degrading your messenger RNAs, the cell will respond to this by decreasing the rate of RNA synthesis in the nucleus. And this is because it doesn't need to produce as many RNAs if those that are there are sticking around longer. So it's a correctional sort of effect. And conversely, if you slow down the rate of RNA synthesis, you can do this by uh, engineering slow pol 2 mutants, for example. So you're producing fewer RNAs, then those that are made will in general stick around longer. They won't be turned over as quickly. And again, the idea here is that the cell is providing sort of a correction to have an appropriate balance of messenger RNA. But we wondered, um, is this homeostatic model or this correction still um, applicable in the reverse situation when you have, instead of slowing down RNA decay, when you greatly accelerate RNA decay. And we reasoned probably not, right? Because accelerating RNA decay turns out to be a, a, a not infrequent um, uh, signature of viral infection, essentially. So we would uh, assume that the cell might interpret this as a threat. And when our cells uh, are faced with a pathogenic threat, they're generally not trying to correct and keep going as is normal. They have strategies to start to shut themselves down. Of course, one of the best characterized of these is shutting down the ribosome through activating pathways like RNAZL and PKR and things like that. Those are needed by the cell, but the cell knows the virus needs that too. And so what I'm going to show you is that a similar type of shutdown response happens during viral threat where instead of correcting and, and achieving homeostasis, the balance is tipped in the opposite direction to accelerate, we think, a global um, shutdown of the cell. All right, so we could initially look for this connection between cytoplasmic RNA degradation and how does that influence uh, uh, transcription of the host genome. Um, by infecting mouse fibroblast cells, MC57Gs, with either wild-type MHV68 virus that has the SOX gene, which triggers RNA decay in the cytoplasm, or a single point mutant version of this virus, where there is a point mutation within the SOX gene that selectively inactivates its ability to efficiently target RNA for cleavage. So importantly, in these cells, these two viruses replicate similarly. Um, so the main difference is really one is accelerating RNA decay in the cytoplasm and one isn't. And then we can measure what is the effect then of that RNA degradation on transcription, either by looking at 
RNA polymerase to occupancy across the host genome by PAL2 chromatin immunoprecipitation or CHIP experiments, or by measuring RNA synthesis um, by using uh, uh, pulse labeling experiments with things like 4-thiouridine. And we do both of these just for simplicity today. I'm, I'm really just going to show you chip data. So this experiment, I think, is nicely representative of uh, what the phenotype is, which is if we're looking across the host genome at where PAL2 is, of course, in an uninfected cell, you see it piled up, um, uh, centered around the transcription start site of genes. However, when we infect with the wild type MHV68, there's a large scale clearance of PAL2 from host promoters. And that clearance is linked to the ability of the virus to degrade RNA in the cytoplasm because that SOX mutant virus does not cause PAL2 removal. So how is it that destroying RNA in the cytoplasm can lead to removal or transcriptional repression in the nucleus? There's a couple of different possibilities. And what I'm gonna tell you today is that we know of at least two different mechanisms by which this is happening. And the first mechanism we described or identified using a more minimalist system, not in the context of infection, but just in cells expressing the SOX nuclease. This can recapitulate um, the RNA degradation phenotype without all of the other things that the virus is doing in the cell. It also is sufficient to recapitulate transcriptional repression. And what we knew from studying that system was that it wasn't the initial cleavage by SOX that mattered. It was that second step that I told you about, the ability of the cellular nucleases to clear those already inactivated fragments. And we knew this because if we depleted cellular nuclease, particularly XRN1, even though all the RNAs were still getting cleaved, there was no transcriptional repression. So how is it that having degradation of these inactive RNA fragments could signal to the nucleus that, um, that something was wrong in the cytoplasm? Well, if you think about what an RNA is doing or looks like in a cell, it's not naked. They're coated by suites of RNA binding proteins. And so as these RNAs are initially cleaved by SOX and then subsequently degraded by cellular enzymes like XRN1, really one of the things that's happening is that those RNA binding proteins are getting evicted from the RNAs that they're bound to, right? Um, and many RNA binding proteins are shuttling proteins. They move in between the nucleus and the cytoplasm um, just because RNA, of course, starts in the nucleus and often ends up in the cytoplasm. And so we thought maybe this destruction of these cleaved RNA fragments is signaling by releasing RNA binding proteins, which may start to then differentially shuttle between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. So they might serve as sort of the, the information um, uh, conduits of uh, the state of RNA in the, in the cytoplasm. So to test that hypothesis, we set out to chart the scale of protein redistribution that happens in cells in response to RNA decay. And we did this um, in collaboration with Uliana Cristea's lab at Princeton because they're really experts in uh, this sort of thing, measuring uh, by mass spectrometry, relocalization of proteins during, um, uh, during viral infection and herpes viral infection in particular. And so what we're doing here is we're basically taking cells, fractionating them into the nuclear and cytoplasmic fraction, extracting all of the proteins, labeling them with isobaric or tandem mass tags um, that can then be deconvoluted later. These, this allows you to basically multiplex um, your mass spec um, uh, experiment and, and, and deconvolute those later. And, and what you can look for then are proteins whose abundance goes up in one compartment and down in a compensatory way in the other department and, and so, or the other compartment. And so what this tells you is that the protein is moving from say the cytoplasm to the nucleus or vice versa. So that's the signature that we were sort of looking for. And we did this, this initial experiment was done in hex cells where we had uh, just either empty vector or um, cell lines with an inducible version of the wild type SOX protein, mu SOX means it's from MHV68 or as a control, a catalytically dead version of SOX that cannot cleave RNAs. 
Um, and then because I said it was that destruction of the cleaved fragments that was important primarily by XRN1, um, we also did this in the background of XRN1 knockout cells to see um, which of the changes that we might observe would be dependent on the ability of that cellular nuclease to clear those fragments. So um, it turns out that this worked quite well and we saw reproducibly a clear signature that proteins were being redistributed out of the cytoplasm and into the nucleus, specifically in cells expressing wild type socks. So that's what's indicated by the dark blue here. There were about 67 proteins in this category. Um, they did not move in cells expressing the catalytically dead version of socks. And about 70% of them didn't move in cells expressing wild type socks, but lacking that cellular XRN1 uh, enzyme. And we looked at all proteins, but if you uh, do go term analysis for the signature of the type of proteins that come out here. It's exactly what you would expect for messenger RNA binding proteins that are getting released. So things like poly A binding, poly U binding, messenger RNA 3' UTR binding. So what this told us is that there's a correlation here, right? There's a correlation between RNA degradation in the cytoplasm and movement of RNA binding proteins to the nucleus. But we want to know, is that movement actually necessary to convey this signal that leads to transcriptional repression? And so a former graduate student in the lab, Chris Duncan Lewis, tested this by blocking the ability of cells to translocate those proteins by treating them with the now infamous drug ivermectin, which doesn't cure COVID, but does target your important alpha beta transport machinery to prevent those proteins from moving. And so this is looking at RNA pol 2 occupancy on a couple of representative host promoters. And so you can see that in cells expressing SOX but not treated with ivermectin, you get this characteristic reduction in pol 2 occupancy at the promoter. But if he pretreats the cells with ivermectin, now that signal is blocked and there's no transcriptional repression. He can show that this is um, despite the fact that there's wild type levels of RNA decay in the cytoplasm. So this tells us that indeed RNA binding protein trafficking is what is important to convey that signal. So the thing that we're really focused on now is asking which of these proteins are important for this phenotype and how are they acting, right? So there's a couple of ways that you can think about this. There could be key players, so individual proteins or sets of proteins that have specific roles when they transit to the nucleus, or it could be more of a mass action type of thing where just the shifting of abundance of proteins um, in the nucleus could be interpreted as a stress signal um, and that it's not sort of any one protein. We favor the um, key player hypothesis because we found at least a couple of key players that matter. Um, and uh, 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 they, the ones that I'm gonna show you are the cytoplasmic poly A binding proteins. These are longtime uh, favorite proteins of, of my lab. We worked on them for a long time. And, and one of the reasons is that they consistently shift to the nucleus during lots of different viral infections. So these are it's steady state in an uninfected cell proteins that are um, reside um, uh, very much predominantly in the cytoplasm where they play important roles in RNA uh, stability and promoting translation. But when you infect cells or have RNA decay accelerated, these guys rush into the nucleus. And so we can see, again, that in uh, cells expressing these cytoplasmic poly A binding proteins, if you have uh, SOX there, you get this transcriptional repression. However, if we deplete these part proteins from cells, you no longer get this transcriptional repression. And furthermore, we can ask if we just drive um, these proteins into the nucleus in the absence of cytoplasmic RNA decay, are they sufficient to trigger transcriptional repression? And the answer to that is um, also yes. Uh, we can do this because of uh, uh, results from Renu Kumar, a former PhD student of mine who's now with Melanie, who showed during her PhD thesis that poly binding protein has um, a non-canonical nuclear localization signals that are buried within its RNA recognition motif. So it is bound to poly A tails that keeps it in the cytoplasm. But as poly A tails are removed during the process of RNA decay, you expose those um, nuclear localization signals and the protein goes into the nucleus. So basically any level of expression of this protein above the availability of poly A tails just goes into the nucleus. 
All right, so we think that this is a relatively specific phenotype because we've tested some other proteins shown here with arrows um, that don't have uh, that that don't seem to have this effect. But we also think that there's things beyond PAV that are doing this because we know that at least for this um, sufficiency experiment here, we have to express the protein at above physiologic levels in order to see this phenotype. If we, um, if we titrate it down to about the levels that you'd see during infection, that's not sufficient, suggesting that, um, that probably other players are involved as well. And so this is the project of a current um, PhD student, Sam Ryder, who's now systematically going through for, for all 67 of these proteins and doing these types of experiments to identify which ones might be involved. And her favorite hypothesis, which she's testing right now, is that these proteins or subsets of these proteins when in the nucleus may compete with the resident RNA binding proteins in the nucleus that bind nascent RNA as it is being transcribed and are important for appropriate transcription, RNA processing, et cetera. And so she's currently doing experiments to look at what are the set of proteins bound to nascent RNA um, uh, normally versus in the face of RNA decay. And do we see that these ones that are getting shifted to the nucleus are occupying the RNA instead? And so. That's our favorite hypothesis. We'll see if it we'll see if it pans out shortly. All right. So that's the first mechanism, one of RNA binding protein release, trafficking into the nucleus, leading to some yet unknown signal that causes a generalized repression of host transcription. But there's a second mechanism that I'm just going to sort of briefly touch on, um, which we did not detect in the minimalist system of just expressing the viral nuclease. We could only see this one um, at play in the context of viral infection. All right. And we detected this again doing a similar um, uh, tandem mass tag based mass spectrometry experiment, but this time we did it in um, cells infected or mock infected with MHV68 or again infected with that single point mutation of MHV68 that's selectively impaired for, for host shutoff. And when we analyzed these data, we saw the same signature of RNA binding protein trafficking, but we saw something else too, which was that there were significant changes, not in the localization necessarily of these upset proteins, um, but also in the total abundance of protein. So there were protein abundance changes and um, which proteins um, whose abundance were changing turned out to be quite interesting because many of them were centered on transcription itself. So um, the ones that I'm gonna briefly talk about today are the components of RNA polymerase II itself. So PAL2 is a 12 subunit enzyme that, is, um, that forms this polymerase. And seven of the 12 subunits of PAL2 are specific to PAL2, whereas the remaining five subunits of PAL2 are actually shared between all of the RNA polymerases in the nucleus, PAL1, which makes ribosomal RNAs, and PAL3, which makes transfer RNAs, amongst other things. And what we observed is that in the nucleus of MHV68 infected cells, there was a selective depletion of the seven out of the 12 subunits of PAL2 that are specific to PAL2, but there was not depletion of those um, shared five subunits. And so we're really curious about this. I think this is interesting for a number of reasons, but one of which is that PAL2 is the only enzyme that is um, uh, whose activity is downregulated during infection. As far as we can tell, PAL1 is generally not affected, and RNA polymerase three activity is enhanced in a major way in these cells. That's another set of really interesting projects that we have that I'm not gonna talk about today. So we're very curious now actually about the crosstalk potentially between PAL2 and PAL3 as there's differential um, uh, control of these subunits. So I wanna say that we see the subunit depletion in MHV68 infected cells, also in KSHV infected cells, and the depletion is not just due to these RNAs getting removed from the, the, the pool and, and sort of um, depletion of the proteins as they're just being degraded because they can't be repopulated. But instead we see that they're, the proteins themselves are undergoing accelerated RNA, uh, protein turnover. And so 
here's an experiment that um, I think demonstrates this, in which um, this is a, a project by current PhD student Leah Gullius, who um, it measures the half-life of these proteins. Um, for example, by treating cells with cyclohexamide to stop new protein synthesis and then tracking the degradation of that existing protein pool. And so what she sees, and I'm just showing you a couple of representative subunits here, is that for subunits like RPB2, which is specific to RNA polymerase 2, compared to cells latently infected with KSHV, so no host shutoff there, um, when she reactivates these cells to enter the lytic cycle, she can see that this protein is being turned over more rapidly in the infected cell than in the uninfected cell, whereas subunits like RPV5, which are shared between the other polymerases, are not undergoing accelerated protein turnover. She can also tag um, these uh, PAL2 subunits with a uh, halo tag. So I'm showing you here this for RPB1, which is the large subunit of RNA PAL2 in a uh, uh, KSHV infected um, B cell line called BCBL1s. And this is nice because it gets a, we can just track turnover of proteins by doing um, a dye swap out experiments. You don't have to treat with cyclohexamide which can have lots of off-target effects in your cell. So what she can track here is you can see your initial starting pool of polymerase, uh, subunit RPB1, and then after an eight-hour chase period on a dye switch, you can see turnover of that polymerase subunit. And if she treats with um, the proteasome inhibitor called Fizumib, she can um, uh, at least partially rescue this turnover, saying that this um, accelerated protein degradation is at least partially driven by, um, by the proteasome. And, and this sort of tagging system that she's developing now should enable her to do screening experiments to identify things like E3 ligases and other factors that are involved in selective subunit turnover during a viral infection and stress. Okay. So I'm going to summarize this first part here, um, in which I've um, described to you two sort of, we think, overlapping pathways that are active during infection that link um, RNA destruction in the cytoplasm to PAL2 transcriptional repression in the nucleus, um, uh, in which uh, the, the host shutoff factor SOX cleaves RNAs, and that um, uh, during destruction of these translationally inactivated uh, fragments, you get release of RNA binding proteins like the poly A binding proteins that go into the nucleus um, and repress PAL2 uh, transcription. In addition, during infection, um, uh, the pool of PAL2 is decreased because of a partially proteasome dependent um, enhanced turnover of PAL2 specific subunits. Now, when we are looking for pathways like this that are activated during infection, we're always keeping in mind that viruses tend to be thieves, not inventors, right? Um, and so uh, what that means is that probably they're tapping into existing pathways that the cell may have engineered for other purposes, um, and that by studying them from the viral perspective, we can learn something about sort of fundamental pathways that our cells uh, have in place. And so we'd spent some time looking for evidence that this pathway might be activated under non-viral stress. Um, and uh, Chris Duncan Lewis, again, former PhD student, identified uh, one, which is in the very early stages of apoptosis, during mitochondrial outer membrane permeabilization, this drives accelerated degradation of cytoplasmic RNA. Um, this was originally shown by uh, uh, a Friedman lab. And um, uh, so sort of akin to what we see during viral infection and its selective turnover of PAL2 transcripts, not of PAL1 or PAL3 transcripts. And Chris found that this triggers a very similar pathway as what we're seeing during infection, where there's relocalization of RNA binding proteins and selective transcriptional repression of PAL2, but not PAL1 or PAL3. Okay. So since many of you who are here probably think about viruses, maybe not herpes viruses, but viruses in general. Um, if you know something about DNA viruses, you might be thinking, well, this is um, great as a potential shutdown mechanism on the host side, but this of course presents a real problem for a herpes virus because they need 
Paul II to transcribe their RNAs. They basically steal this enzyme um, uh, because without it, they you get no viral transcription. And so how do they get around this? And of course, herpes viruses are real masters at getting around any restriction, basically, that the host throws at them. And this one they figured out, of course, and are very effectively able to escape it. And their strategy for escape is a pretty similar or um, standard uh, viral process, which is formation of replication compartments, which herpes viruses do in the nucleus. These replication compartments are not membrane bound, but they're local concentrations of amplifying viral DNA. Um, and uh, importantly, when this viral DNA amplifies during lytic uh, infection, it is relatively um, not chromatinized. You have a lot of open DNA. Open DNA serves as a sponge for nucleic acid binding proteins, um, things like the polymerase. So in this way, the virus is able to soak up the available polymerase that it needs. Um, and really, the population of the polymerase that's going down is just the pool of polymerase that would be active on cellular um, uh, DNA uh, and not the pool that becomes active on viral DNA in these replication compartments. But this brings up what I think is another really interesting facet of herpes viral biology, which is that these replication compartments with their non-chromatinized DNA, which of course in our nucleus, we use this to organize DNA very carefully so that it can be transcriptionally controlled appropriately without chromatin um, in these replication compartments, how is it that these viruses are able to orchestrate very precise transcriptional control in a kinetic way, um, which they can do with exquisite precision, particularly late in the viral life cycle. And, and that's what I'm gonna shift now to uh, for the, the last 10 or 12 minutes of my talk. So, any DNA virus, it doesn't matter if you're a bacteriophage or an adenovirus or a herpes virus or a papillomavirus, any DNA virus that we know of regulates its gene expression kinetically um, and, and that it forms sort of two very general groups of uh, gene ex genes that get expressed. There are the early genes, which by definition is any gene whose transcription initiates before the onset of viral DNA replication. These are usually turned on by um, viral transcriptional activators that recruit and assemble um, uh, viral uh, host transcription uh, complexes or um, uh, pre-initiation complexes or PICs that are conceptually, we think, quite similar to our own promoters in, in the host genome. Their, their um, promoters themselves have lots of, of elements that resemble host promoters, et cetera. And in fact, these types of promoters have been used in biology um, early on in, in, in uh, understanding how it is that eukaryotic transcription complexes assemble. So they've been really useful tools. The second category of genes are the so-called late genes. And by definition, a late gene is a gene whose transcription cannot initiate until the virus has started DNA replication. So these are DNA replication dependent transcription events, which in itself is super interesting. Um, these are genes that encode things like capsid protein that the virus doesn't need until after it has replicated its DNA, because that's when it needs the house to, to um, package that DNA into. You also, though, need a ton of these proteins, right? These are not enzymes. You need these in stoichiometric amounts. And so how is it that you get the cell to pump out huge amounts of protein at the end of the viral life cycle in this very um, sort of hairball complicated uh, replication factory um, when the cell is probably resource poor and quite stressed at that period of time. You might think they have really robust promoters that um, uh, can drive rampant transcription, and that is in fact not true at all. The promoters on these late genes are hyper minimalistic. They have little else uh, aside from a modified TATA box. So it's a TATT element instead of a TATA element. This is basically just a wimpier version of a TATA box. You can find TATT throughout the host genome too. Um, and so no explanation really of how you build this regulation in by looking at the promoter, because those promoters don't give us any clues as to how regulation might happen. Furthermore, 
We know that the virus, um, both, uh, this is sort of conserved from beta and gamma herpes viruses, they all encode a set of six different proteins um, shown here, known as the viral transcriptional activators or VTAs. If these proteins, as far as we can tell, their only job in infection is to coordinate activation of these late promoters. This is something that I find really weird. Um, I find it weird because even though herpes viruses as, as uh, eukaryotic viruses go are pretty large, they still kind of uh, are very constrained genome wise. And, and I think of viruses as being masters of genetic and genomic economy, right? One viral protein can do a million different things. So having six different viral proteins that you've dedicated to the job of turning on not that many, more than six late gene promoters seems really inefficient and strange for a virus to use this strategy, but it is a very conserved strategy. So it tells us that works well. So we've studied this complex quite a bit, um, and we know that one of these factors, and this is something that we've shown together with Nevin Krogan's group um, back in 2015, one of these factors um, has a domain that functionally mimics cellular Tata binding protein, or TBP. This is the protein that docks onto Tata boxes. It's sort of the initiating event of building a, a pre-initiation complex. Um, but this protein, does things that cellular TBP doesn't do. And one very important thing it does is that it has an extra domain that can bind directly uh, to RNA polymerase II, the large subunit, and bring the whole polymerase to these promoters. So this combination of sequence-specific DNA binding um, and direct interaction with the polymerase um, is not the way eukaryotic transcriptional assembly happens. This is much more like sigma factors in prokaryotic biology. So we're kind of intrigued by the ability of these viruses to borrow bacterial principles um, and bring them into eukaryotic cells. But that's not all that's necessary. It also needs the remaining five proteins, forms a complex with these, and the architecture of that complex turns out to be really important. We've shown that if you break individual contacts between any two of these proteins, um, late gene transcription is dead and the virus is dead. So this complex, we think, because of its conservation, is a great target potentially for antiviral therapy. But first, we want to understand better how is this process regulated, all right? We're taking a lot of approaches for that, and I'm going to tell you about one of them um, that is done by a current PhD student, Chloe McCollum, in the lab. So Chloe reasoned that um, for us to understand better how this late gene complex is regulated, we needed a better understanding of what are the factors involved. And it's challenging to identify factors involved in the process of transcription because um, uh, transcription complexes are inherently plastic, right? They're shape shifters. They're moving and exchanging factors as the polymerase complex is docked at a promoter or um, uh, moving through a gene or undergoing termination, et cetera. So what it looks like at one stage may not at all be what it looks like, you know, a half a, you know, fraction of a second later at another stage. And so classical sort of techniques for understanding protein-protein interactions tend not to work well for that. So Chloe instead used, decided to use the approach of proximity labeling, which many of you are probably familiar with. What this um, entails is fusing a promiscuous, promiscuous biotin ligase, BRA, which here is called TurboID, to your complex of interest. Um, you can then flow biotin into cells, and this ligase will biotinylate any protein that is within the neighborhood of a three to 10 nanometers of your complex. And then you can lyse your cells and because biotin binds very tightly to streptavidin, you can use streptavidin beads to pull out the labeled proteins. Um, I drew this like it's sort of simple. This was actually um, more than a year of work on Chloe's part to identify where on this complex she could endogenously label it with a turbo ID to maintain wild type levels of activity. Nonetheless, she did this. To do this type of experiment, you also have to layer in a ton of controls to make sure that um, you're identifying proteins that are sort of really there and not just there because of mass action. Uh, I won't go over those except for to say she's super rigorous and did all of them. Um, what I will tell you is that when um, uh, she layered on all of those controls, she found 45 proteins 
that in um, three replicates of this experiment were consistently sort of at the scene of the crime. They were right there around this late gene transcription complex. So that tells us they're there. It doesn't tell us they're doing anything functional for late gene transcription. So for this, she had to develop some functional assays and this required some more tool building, which she did in collaboration with um, recently sort of finished postdoc Allison Didichek. What they engineered into the backbone of KSHV uh, were reporter genes, fluorescent reporter genes like GFP that were driven either by viral early promoters or by viral late promoters. So they could use these as fluorescence-based readouts on early versus late gene transcription, and then run these 45 proteins through um, Cas9-based screens to ask if they're knocked out, do you selectively impair late gene transcription or early gene transcription, or they have no phenotype? For HITS there, she ran all of them then through secondary screens uh, to validate with siRNAs to sort of get around any caveats that might have been there in the first screen or en engineered individual viral knockouts. Okay, so what did she find? Well, we were sort of initially most interested in what cellular HITS might be there, and she did find a bunch of cellular HITS, which with functions that seem to be sort of um, you know, in line with maybe what we'd expect, things that are involved in transcription and RNA processing and RNA stability. But the problem is, is that when she ran these through the functional screen, those that validated were broadly important for viral gene expression. So not only did they impair late gene transcription, they also impaired early gene transcription. So this means that they're important, probably, but it doesn't mean that these are the things that we were looking for, which is what is specifically involved in regulating um, this unique late gene transcription complex. And so she then turned instead to the viral hits of which there were 10. Most of these were the other late gene transcriptional activators that we knew should be there. So that's good, positive controls couple members of the viral DNA replication machinery also makes sense because we know this is a DNA replication dependent event, and then a couple of oddballs. And I'm gonna spend uh, the last couple of slides telling you about one of these oddballs, which is the protein ORF29. And this is just showing you the results of that functional um, uh, fluorescence-based screen where she could see that uh, uh, depletion of ORF29 yielded a significant impairment, sort of similar to these other late gene transcriptional activator positive controls in late gene expression, but had no defect in early gene expression. Um, she validated this by making a stop mutant uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in KSHV where she prevented endogenous ORC29 from being expressed and then looked at expression of, of uh, late protein products or early protein products. And again, she could see that there was um, a significant reduction in late protein products like K.1, but not in any of the early protein products she looked at. All right, so what's ORF29? Well, it turns out ORF29 is the catalytic subunit of the viral terminase, which is um, a three subunit enzyme that is critical for um, packaging viral DNA. So herpes viral DNA is replicated in these long concatamers, which are then um, threaded through a portal into these nascent icosahedral capsids. And so the terminase is the molecular motor that does this threading. It is a really powerful motor. Um, uh, the density within packaged capsids is quite, uh, the pressure is quite high. Uh, the DNA is present at near liquid crystalline density in these icosahedra. So this is a, a quite an impressive motor. And ORF29 is the catalytic subunit of that motor. So we had no reason to think, uh, because there's no precedent for thinking that this packaging reaction could be involved in the specific transcriptional control of late genes. Um, and one thought we had was, well, maybe um, by getting rid of ORF29, of course, you're messing up the packaging reaction. And so without anywhere for all that replicated DNA to go, you just might be creating way more chaos in the replication compartments and non-specifically impairing late gene transcription in that way. So to test that, um, we could block packaging using an alternative strategy. And a couple of years ago, um, we had identified a different packaging factor in KSHV called ORF68, which we showed separately from the terminase was essential for um, viral packaging. So we could ask if we block packaging by getting rid of ORF68, does this also lead to a late gene uh, defect? This is just showing you that we get rid of ORF68, no virus produced because there's no packaged virions. 
Um, but importantly, there was no late gene defect. So again, again, I'm showing you a protein, this K.1 late protein expressed similarly in a wild type or an R68 mutant or an R68 mutant rescue virus, same as early genes. So just blocking packaging doesn't do it. Okay, so in my last slide uh, for, for data, what Chloe wanted to evaluate then is, well, is the terminase being used in some new way, maybe as a scaffold um, uh, that doesn't require its catalytic activity, or does its ATPase activity matter for this transcriptional regulation? So to test this, she engineered specific point mutations within either the ATP binding motif, the Walker A motif, or the ATP hydrolysis motif, the Walker B motif, and asked um, then, do these catalytic mutants of ORF29, can they complement an ORF29 delete virus uh, like wild type ORF29 can? So she used lentiviral transduction to, to assess that. And um, I will direct your attention to just one of these lanes because basically all the mutants were the same, which is that if we ablate its catalytic activity, you cannot rescue the late gene defect like you can with wild type ORF29, even though these mutants are all expressed similarly. So the catalytic activity of the terminase is playing some role in potentiating late gene expression. So I'll leave you with the idea here that transcription of beta and gamma herpes viral late genes is incredibly sophisticated, not only does it involve coordination with the DNA replication machinery? It involves assembly of a unique hybrid virus host transcription pre-initiation complex on highly minimalistic promoters. Um, this connection to DNA replication is standard for all DNA viruses, but we now have a, a very novel connection here that is new for any of the DNA viruses, which is also a connection to the DNA packaging reaction. And um, using the catalytic subunit of the viral terminase in some way to potentiate this um, process as well. Perhaps uh, it involves scanning and clearing the DNA or something like that. Um, those are sort of future experiments. All right, I'm just going to end by highlighting the, the work of the people that I showed you today. This is a mostly current uh, image of, of people in the lab, uh, all of whom are amazing and, and, and fun to work with. Uh, the first part of the story that I was talking about, host shutoff and, and transcriptional repression, was carried out, uh, the published work, by these three former students who have all uh, since recently gotten their PhDs and moved on to other scientific positions um, and is being now carried out by Leah Gullius, a current PhD student. And all of the late gene expression uh, work was done primarily by PhD student Chloe McCollum um, and also with uh, important help from Alison Didichuk, who um, just a couple of months ago left and started her own lab uh, in the biochemistry department at Yale. Um, and uh, of course, I mentioned Ileana Cristea is a really important collaborator here. Uh, and I will stop now, leave up this summary image of the work that I showed you today, and just throw out there that if you are a going to soon graduate a PhD student and you found any of this interesting, um, I am looking to hire a couple of postdocs in the coming year. So thank you so much for your attention. More than happy to take any questions if you have them. Awesome. Thank you so much for the great talk. Um, there are questions in chat, but I guess I'll start with uh, if anybody wants to raise their hands, um, we can take your questions. No? OK. Um, let's start with the question in chat, and then we'll come back. Oh, OK. Charlie Craig. Please uh, unmute yourself. You can go ahead. I uh, still muted. Okay, there we go. No. Getting there. Uh, sorry. Hi, Brett. That was a wonderful <laughs> talk. <laughs> sorry. I'm having problems over here. Um, two quick questions. Does Latermavir work on KSHV as well as on CMV? And is it, if it does, is it possible that that's what you're showing is perhaps some of the effects of why latermavir works? Mm, great question. So uh, latermavir, it turns out it's specific to CMV. Um, and the reason for that is that the packaging complex, uh, there are 
herpes, individual herpes virus um, differences between them. So I think it's going to be an amazing drug for things that are, you know, transplant recipients and things like that, where CMV is a major problem. But unfortunately, it will not work against the gamma herpes viruses. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that also answered your second question. Well, do you think the way it's working on CMV is similar to what uh, we're working in KSHV? Uh, yeah. Um, I, that is a good question. And I guess the short answer is I'm not sure because I can't remember, and maybe you can, I can't remember whether it targets the catalytic subunit of the terminase or uh, another process there. Yes, um, par partly. It's one of its effects. <laughs> so yeah, might, might be worth, okay. And then yeah. just, I, I don't want to hog, but for the first part, how do you think the process of, of Paul II subunit degradation is avoided in the compartmentalization model you're showing. Yeah, okay. Right. Um, pure speculation, because I don't know. <laughs> okay. But what I think is happening is that, um, that there is activation of um, uh, one or more, say, E3 ligases who cannot access the replication compartment. So the replication compartment, um, while it can soak up lots of things, it is not just a non-specific soaker upper of stuff in the nucleus. There are um, there are host factors that are specifically excluded from replication compartments. So my hypothesis would be that there's something that gets triggered but cannot access the replication compartment because there are proteasomes in the replication compartment too. But you just for some reason um, the pol two that's there we don't think is getting turned over. Thanks, Britt. Great sure. Time. Melanie, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Britt. This was a great talk. <clears throat> I see this story growing and growing over the years, and it's really wonderful how many details you have put into the into the overall picture here. Um, I just wanted to sort of get your overall impression on how taxing all these changes are um, on the on the um on the host cell. Obviously, it's a lytic infection, so there's a lot of, you know, toxicity there, but but then also how how is what is happening, you know, during latency? Is there still, you know, a major reconstruction that keeps the cell active or, you know, drains it of resources or is it sort of more of an inert state? Yeah, um, I would say that that latency, there are gene expression changes on the host, but they are much more subtle. So it doesn't make sense for the latent cell to do things to the host that are gonna be toxic in the long-term, obviously. Yes. Um, it, same with HIV, there's, there's um, a very limited subset of viral genes that are expressed during latency. One of them is the factor that basically tethers the genome to the host chromatin and ensures its, its replication. So there's not much, it's, it tends to be much more subtle changes to the host gene expression during latency. Lytic infection is where all of the things that I've described are happening. And at the end of lytic infection, the cell is basically destined to die, we think. So in the it's what we'd like to do is say, could we stop this partway through and then ask, can the cell recover from that? We probably have to do that in an uninfected cell because I don't know ways to stop an infection partway through uh, in a tissue culture system and have the cell be able to be um, recovering from that. But I, we have some ideas for how we might do that to ask if it's reversible or if this is sort of a one-way path to we're just shutting ourselves down. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question in the chat. Um, I can read it out for you. Um, basically, uh, what happens to the fitness of the virus if you delete one of the repetitive herpes virus encoded late gene transcription factors? Uh, the virus is dead. It cannot tolerate <laughs> loss of any of these late gene transcription factors. And we can make very subtle changes to these factors that just appoint mutations that mean that they cannot bind their partners as well. And the, the uh, complex is dead and the virus is dead. So um, this. This, the formation of these, these, um, these late gene transcriptional activator complexes is really critical and uh, not the virus does not seem to be able to tolerate almost any perturbation to those that we've been able to identify. Cool. Um, Fran, do you have a question? Oh, okay, I can read it out for you. Um, another question, um, I was wondering what is the link between SOX, XRN1 and 
RBP shuttling with the idea of the formation of stressed granules as a host machinery mechanism to stall mRNA translation and block viral translation. Yeah, so um, stress granules are obviously something that is manipulated a lot uh, uh, during a variety of viral infections. And KSHV, like many other viruses, have ways of um, ensuring that their RNAs are not stuck within stress granules. They tend to be um, dissolved during lytic replication. We don't think that that process, so that's not work done by us. We don't think that that process is directly linked to host shutoff, but it's a process that probably complements it, right? Because in thinking that you need ways to ensure that stress granules are not um, uh, forming and preventing the viral RNAs from being translated. So it's a good question. Cool, super interesting. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and I think um, we'll have lunch a bit later, right? Uh, but anyway, thank you so much for everyone for coming. And thank you so much for uh, Dr. Groundsinger for coming here and giving us a great talk. Thanks for the opportunity and for showing up and the questions. <laughs> thank you, Britt. Bye. Thank yeah. You.